Hi, and welcome to our special event, Learning via Immersive Media Insights from Flight and Aircraft Maintenance Training, is brought to you by Radiant. My name is Josh DuPont, and I am a marketing specialist with Radiant, and I will be your host today. Um, I would like to thank our audience for taking the time out of their day, and of course, our guest speakers, uh, Amen Powers and Eric Fullerton. We have a lot of exciting ground to cover, so let's get moving. Uh, first, I'd like to give a brief rundown on today's agenda. This webinar should last about 30 minutes. Uh, we'll start with a very quick introduction of our guest speakers, uh, Amen Powers and Eric Fullerton, followed by our fireside chat. And then we will conclude with a live Q&A with our audience. Uh, if you'd like to participate in the Q&A, please submit your questions in the chat, and we'll get to as many of them as time allows. Okay, let's get moving. Uh, Amen is the manager of product design at Flight Safety International. He's also a doctoral candidate at Old Dominion University. Thank you, Amen, for uh, your time today. We're uh, happy that you are here. Thanks. And uh, Eric leads the learning and organizational change practice at Radiant. Eric has an MS in education from Purdue University. Eric, uh, thank you for your time as well. We're looking forward to this conversation between uh, you and Amen. Um, you know, and with that, Eric, uh, I'm gonna pass the mic over to you. Okay, thanks for joining us, Amen. I appreciate your time. Um, so, you know, pilot training uh, and uh, aircraft maintenance training has been on the forefront of, of technical learning for many decades. And um, I think there's a lot of lessons for our uh, customers in other industries that rely on technical personnel uh, to maintain safe operations, to be able to um, uh, execute those skills and, and, and get the knowledge transfer that they need. So tell me a little bit about um, how you go about that. I, you know, as, as an instructional designer myself, I, I'm often faced with a situation where, you know, I'm, I'm sitting across from an SME and the SME is telling me this is what they need to know, you know, and, and they have a, a list, you know, or a PowerPoint. But as instructional designers, we know that that's not often the, the, the best uh, way to approach uh, the fundamentals of, of defining what needs to be learned. So tell us a little bit about how they handle that at, at flight safety. Yeah, well, you know, first of all, thanks uh, to uh, Josh and, and yourself for participating today. And thanks for having me. I really appreciate it and getting the opportunity to talk about this stuff because this is fun. Um, yeah, so the, in terms of the, the techniques we use, uh, whether it's cognitive task analysis or, you know, training needs analysis, there's a bunch of different words that are used here. But we, we do use cognitive task analysis quite a bit uh, because we're interested in uh, we're, we're interested in the thought process behind things, it would, uh, the why of things, right? And that's really what it gets down to. So yeah, when you typically talk to a SME, they'll be very, uh, let's call it tactical, right? In in sense of the person needs to know this. Uh, in almost, a, you know, they almost taken like from an agile mindset, the, the person needing to know something is almost like the feature set or the user story. Sure, they need to know that, but what does that mean? Uh, and then breaking that down is really a, a significant part of what we do, you know? So a person might need to turn on an airplane, right? Which is a pretty typical thing. Uh, but then what that technically means is they've uh, accomplished these, you know, like 10 or 15 tasks beforehand. And there are certain levels of competency that are required to both, you know, do it natively, meaning be able to perform without being prompted or being able to, you know, perform with the use of a checklist or something like that. So that's kind of how we break it down. We take it from, uh, we, we take the SME's word for exactly what it is. And then we kind of reverse engineer, like not reverse engineer, but we kind of go back and understand all the little building blocks that go into that little nugget of knowledge that the SME has. Yeah. And, you know, for people that are not familiar with cognitive task analysis, for example, can you talk a little bit about what that process actually, actually looks like, you know, like the, I, I the reason I ask this is because oftentimes when, when I say, you know, we need to get a little bit deeper with our analysis, you know, let's bring some, some cognitive task analysis and, uh, you know, just to, to, to give people a sense, you know, cognitive task analysis is not a thing. It is a, a way of extracting information. There's many different methods of doing that. So tell us a little bit about some of the methods that you employ. 
Yeah, so you know, we 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 practice uh, in, depending on what we're trying to accomplish, right? Uh, basically, the what we're trying to do is um, uh, we we look at things like competencies, right, rather than uh, necessarily straight behavioral traits, right? You know, so as soon as you have straight behavioral traits, you're like a person will do this to this level of force, or a person will do, you know, like those get very uh, molecular, right? Uh, and in, especially when we get into immersive media, there's a bit of that that actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, but what we do is uh, we recognize that each individual learner comes to, uh, this, uh, comes to the world with a certain set of predispositions, right? So in, in instructional design, we call that schema, right? And realistically, what we want to do is we want the, the SME is an is, the SME self admittedly is an expert uh, and an expert uh, you know we get into the meaning of expert uh, expert comes from uh, the Greek which means a person that tried a bunch right and so uh, that person has a lot of really uh, hands on experience or practical experience with what they're doing. Uh, so when you're bringing that to a person that doesn't have that experience, you need to kind of fill in the gaps with how a person uh, got there, right? And knowing where the person came from, so that's kind of the demographics and their uh, kind of background information, we need to understand that part so that we can then meet the learner where they're at, right? You know, because that's how we make sure that the knowledge transfer uh, as best we can uh, occurs and, and that gets into a message design and that gets into appropriate methodology or modality of training intervention. Um, and so that's how we kind of break it down. We, we look at our learners and we say, okay, what are the things that our learners are really going to, uh, what are the things that are going to mean something to them at whatever period of the training they're at? Because our, our training is a bit segmented, right? Uh, like kind of on purpose, building block approach. And um, so that's kind of how we do it. it it's, it's kind of about chunking, if you will. You know, one, one thing we often do in, in uh, oil and gas is um, uh, retroactive protocol analysis, where we have uh, a room that is a simulator and the, the uh, learner is using the simulator to try to uh, execute a specific task. And we record that and then sit down with them and and kind of talk about the the why they made those choices and so on. Yeah. When we show those types of uh, analyses or those videos of, of the person actually talking about why they made the choice, when they made it and what was what was the calculus going on for them. When we show those to subject matter experts and say, look, this is the actual thought process that's going on with, with the learner here. See how much different it is than the thought process you would go through in that same moment. And, and that, that really, I see light bulbs go on for people when they see those kinds of things it, because they, they begin to realize how much different an expert thinks about a task and what, what types of vectors that knowledge is coming from in order to be able to, in order to be able to, uh, uh, you know, e execute the tasks. Uh, and I think that all of that, you know, your, 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 what you just talked about and, and then, and, and then just from my experiences in the field, I think what it comes down to is that, you know, the, the traditional idea that we can sit in a room with a subject matter expert and extract the knowledge precisely for what we need to, to, uh, uh, give to the learners is not often, not often going to be the best result, right? I think, I think that there's a hesitancy uh, for people, and it's always related to cost, right? But it's I think there's a hesitancy of, for people uh, in in some of these other industries um, where there isn't hasn't been as much uh, analysis of how learning and performance actually results in in specific outcomes, right? That's I'm sure that is, has been studied ad nauseum, you know, within within uh, flight safety, you know, but. But for some of these other industries, I mean, there's a, a mentality that there is a relationship, but there hasn't been, you know, rigorous uh, scientific study around it. And I think that there's a hesit hesit hesitancy to spend that money when in reality, a little bit more analysis up front could, could result in, in much better uh, learning outcomes on the back end. You know? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, the the there is some research out there that's kind of interesting from the SME, like you know, in, in dealing with a work. Well, in dealing is not the right word, but essentially in working with SMEs, to to kind of indicate that if if you're gonna if you're trying to get you know 100% of the knowledge that's required in a course to be figured out, you you need three SMEs because everyone prioritizes even within their own personal 
kind of thought, they're, they're prioritizing the solution for the clients or the uh, learners that they've experienced, right? So they're like, oh, the typical people I work with, they, they need this. But in reality, there's like an interchange there because everyone's presentation style, especially when you have like an, an instructor led uh, circumstance, like we often do in, in kind of our in technical environments, interestingly enough, you have more instructor led uh, than you do in, you know, con conventional learning environments at this point. Um, and so, you know, what, what winds up happening is you, you've got like various filters of how information comes out. So there's been some studies that say you probably need about three SMEs to really get the information out. But what you've uh, kind of described, like the, we, we, we typically do that in like uh, either the rapid prototyping event or something where we'll have something we show and people interact with it. And one thing that's been really great about immersive media is immersive media really actually requires a bunch of that conversation up front. And initially everyone's like a little like, oh man, this is gonna take forever mm -hmm. because like, oh, well like, you know, a checklist might say check this thing, but that requires opening a door. And you know, the developer, they don't know to open the door. They're like, how do I open this thing? And then they're like, yeah, well you gotta open the door there. Now that's a really simplified example, but even there that uh, off what we've experienced thus far with our, our development efforts and immersive media, we've seen that it really clicks for the SMEs a lot of times to be like, oh, like, it's not just the end, it's the how. And, and for a lot of SMEs, they, they, they begin to understand that a bit better and they begin to put themselves in the shoes of a person that doesn't know as much as they do, right? You know, so like, okay. Uh, and honestly, sometimes we have it work in the reverse way. That, then they think the person is coming in and they have absolutely no prior experience with anything. And that's when we almost have to like bring them back and like, no, they know how to use a screwdriver just fine. Like that's going to be okay, you know? Yeah. yeah. It goes back to that, uh, that, that most fundamental in, instructional uh, lesson of telling somebody how only with words, how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or, or whatever. Exactly. You know, yeah. like, it'll end up on the floor, you know, it'll end up like in another room and so on. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, Josh, next next slide, please. All right. So you know, this is this is something that I I think is uh, you know pretty prevalent with with uh, over the course of the last decade in in all learning, uh, whether it's K through twelve or you know professional learning or what have you. Is it's all about the mantra is build realistic scenarios, right? But oftentimes there's there's difficulty whether it's you know the the lack of technology or, or the complexity of, this, of the situation or what have you. Can you talk a little bit about what kinds of difficulties you face in, in building realistic scenarios and, and how you surmount those and, and talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so this is, I would say, uh, this, is, this is like my bread and butter, if you will. This is the thing I do all day because uh, the, the reason for it is scenarios are really, really effective. However, oftentimes uh, what happens is with a scenario, they get either way too big or way too small. And, and what, I, what I try to uh, emphasize is, you know, we, we've got uh, from that training needs analysis or from the cognitive task analysis or whatever type of analysis you do, we'll, you know, of course we'll have a certain set of requirements, right? You know, especially when you're dealing with regulators, uh, you're going to set, you, you will have to say somewhere that you covered this thing. And so oftentimes we think, oh, well, we'll train, we'll, we'll, we'll train one way to cover these things and then we'll do scenarios. And you're like, not necessarily, maybe some circumstances that makes sense, but in a lot of other circumstances, it's about right-sizing the scenario. So uh, in my neck of the woods, what tends to happen uh, in the aviation industry is sometimes people try to make scenarios, these huge, long things, right? You know, with this scenario is going to last four hours. And in my, in my experience, that's not effective because you're, the scenario, like you ultimately, the person or the medium to present that scenario has got to be able to provide four hours of really contextually relevant scenario. In my experience, what is far more important is, is right-sizing your scenario to make sense for the learning activity that you're trying to accomplish. So if, for instance, you're trying to do, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're setting the context. Uh, so for instance, like recently, um, we, we've been building some maintenance stuff and the context, the initial scenario context is the airplane is outside and uh, you read in the, you know, you read in the information manual or you read in the uh, pilot report, this thing is broken. Well, that's, that is a real life scenario. 
And it didn't require me to build anything all that fancy. It, it just set the person's expectations in their brain to something that they're, uh, they're kind of used to because the way people communicate is, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, when you're writing a report or something like that is different from when you're talking to someone. And, and oftentimes the pilots are writing something in a book that a mechanic is going to look at six hours later. And so that in itself is a realistic scenario. We don't need six hours to cover that. We can cover that in like two minutes. And it sets the stage very appropriately for then all of the tasks that they naturally have to do right after that to evaluate whether, whether what they're trying to accomplish makes sense. So it's really about uh, scenarios are, for me, scenarios are really about setting the appropriate context. And then the secondary element of it is making sure that within the learning experience, if your scenario is going to span throughout the learning experience, making sure that the piece parts within that learning experience relate to that scenario. Because if you bring someone out of the scenario, they're going to, they're going to kind of, they're going to see that as a negative, right? They're going to see that as a, um, okay, this doesn't really jive. Why did I do this over here? And then that, that lowers the, um, that lowers the overall instructional experience, which, you know, generally speaking, lowers their retention of the knowledge. Yeah, I mean, in energy, we see it all the time. You know, people have this concept when we, we pitch the idea of doing, because, you, know, you know, much of this that we're doing with, within energy is also in, instructor-led, right? As you said before, like, it's probably the, the greatest prevalence of instructor-led training that, that still exists because everyone's gone to Zoom training and so forth and so yeah. on. You know? But you, a lot of, a lot of these, these technical skills can't be done over Zoom, right? And if you try to do it, it's, it just, it's, it's so uh, difficult that, that it, you, it's impossible to accomplish. But we, we, when we pitch these, these ideas of, of scenarios to clients, they're like, well, we, don't, we can't get all these people in the same room at the same time. And like that's, it's not necessary to have everyone in the same room at the same time. It's all about inputs and outputs, right? Like mm -hmm. what happens right before I go to do task A, right? What, what, what's my setup? As long as, as long as the input is there, it could be a recording of someone talking, right? If you want to make it, you know, realistic or what have you, but it doesn't have to involve everyone at the same time, right? It just has to be well-planned. Mm -hmm. All right, Josh, next slide, please. All right, so you know, certainly talk about um, uh, the uh, immersive technology and how how that works, you know, for for pilots and so on. Tell me about how you've uh, you think about immersive technology and its application and and more traditional teaching message and creating blended learning and all those sorts of ideas. Excuse me. Well, yeah, so we, uh, my, my industry is uh, fairly unique in the sense that we've been using immersive technology, might have been called immersive technology, but we've been using immersive technology since like, you know, the 50s, a full, uh, <coughs> a full flight simulator, uh, which obviously has had significant advancements in uh, image quality and, uh, you know, with fidelity to a flight uh, deck. Um, is is in itself a, a technological marvel right but right now you know you've got a circumstance where you've got these things uh, operating around the world where the first time a person actually flies the, the level of fidelity of those things is so high that the first time they actually fly the air the first time they're in the airplane is the time they're flying it for the first time there's no training that's necessary in the airplane at this point because the simulators are that good but even with that in terms of the teaching methods uh, at no point did anyone say oh, all you need is the simulator, right? What we've essentially established since, you know, the beginning there was, okay, you're going to do a bit of, say, theoretical knowledge, then you're going to do a bit of uh, integration training, and then you're going to get into the simulator, and then you're going to go into, uh, you're going to go in real life in the real airplane, but because all the, because the airplanes are a crew, you're in kind of a mentor-apprentice relationship for a, a, me, a small amount of time. And so that right there represents, for me, the, a, a good representation of the various training methods you want to use depending on your, your use case, right? And depending, obviously, some of this is going to depend on your, how much money you can spend. Not everyone's going to be able to build gigantic simulators. Uh, but even when we get down to the headsets and, and uh, you know, it's, it's about making sure that, uh, it, especially if you you know, kind of believe in a building block approach, which seems like uh, makes sense in some regards because you have to have, you essentially give space for iteration of knowledge. 
and that's one thing that we 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 run into a lot when we're talking about immersive media. Uh, it's kind of similar to a conversation that had they had with iPads, say like ten years ago or twelve years ago. Oh, I have an iPad. I don't need a book anymore. Um, that's not true, right? Uh, the 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 reality is a lot of people prefer books. That preference winds up leaning to uh, you know that that preference winds up leading to certain kind of user experiences. But then secondarily, the research is actually kind of interesting in that in that the uh, omni kind of uh, omni faced relationship of an iPad. Uh, relative to the specific position in a book and writing in the book uh, codes your information slightly differently. Now, so I'm not saying that that's always going to be the case, but that certainly seems like it's the case now. So it's not necessarily about like replacing one teaching method with another. It's about are there opportunities for new tools like immersive media, for instance, like VR headsets and AR and stuff like that. Are there places that right now we're not optimized, the, the training experience isn't optimized based off of the technology we, we had? I still think there's going to be uh, instructor-led training for probably ever, right? I mean, I mean that, right? Because yeah. uh, it's going to make sense in certain circumstances. But I think we have plenty of evidence to say it doesn't make sense in all uh, circumstances. And it's really about us figuring out, as, as instructional designers, it's about us figuring out the appropriate fit. Absolutely. All right, Josh, next, please. Sorry if I took all the time there, Eric. My bad, man. No, that's good, man. I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm fascinated. I, lo I love hearing this stuff, you know? Um, so, you know, talk, talk to me about fidelity, right? Fidelity for different learner levels. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm especially interested to hear uh, about, you know, how you, how you accomplish this specifically for maintenance personnel, you know, and, and what you're doing in that space. Yeah, so fidelity is an interesting thing, right? Um, uh, fidelity is seen as there's there's kind of two different paths in an, an instructional sense. There's cognitive fidelity, meaning how uh, close to your mental process does something look, right? And then there's uh, there's uh, you know visual fidelity, which is how close does what you're seeing look to reality, right? And those are it's, a, it's it, sometimes those get mixed up, but in reality, a, a good way to represent this is uh, in like video games, right? You know, so there's a lot of video games out there that are puzzle games, right? And the, uh, you, you might have like a really low poly, very tune shaded, like very basic video game there, but the puzzles themselves uh, activate the puzzle side of your brain. I mean, a Rubik's cube is a very basic designed thing, but the uh, requirements to solving a Rubik's Cube in include uh, some kind of algorithmic process that hopefully if you want to solve a Rubik's Cube, like my, my nine-year-old son wants to, he's going to have to figure out. And that's actually a high level of difficulty for a nine-year-old kid. Uh, whereas visually, uh, you can have very complex, very rich environments, like a AAA video game or something like that, and it looks real, right? The thing that's interesting that I find is that the, depending on, again, going back to knowing who your users are, a person that's got a lot of experience in something, and this is one of the challenges we have in a technical field like our, like oil and gas or like aviation, is you have a lot of people uh, that are in, that are in the system, uh, that they're in the training environment, they need repeated training, right, uh, generally, like whether it's year to year or on a multi-year schedule. And if you're going to bring uh, an immersive experience to them, if you're going to bring some type of immersive media to them, the thing is they have a ton of experience in real life. So their reaction to something that doesn't look like real life is going to be very different from a person that has very little experience in real life, uh, seeing something that maybe doesn't meet the visual fidelity requirements you're looking for, right? So I think there's a lot of interesting stuff that we can play with there. And honestly, that's a significant portion of the research I do uh, uh, at Old Dominion at the moment, uh, because I'm, I'm really interested in that balance between what, uh, you know, how much, how immersive do we have to make something for it to make sense to certain demographics of people? Because I have a feeling that it, it relates to a person's uh, my, my hypothesis, if I was going to give one, is it relates to a person's previous experience, either with a medium or with the subject matter. And uh, it, it also depends on the type of task you're trying to accomplish. Um, the, the level of fidelity in both the cognitive and the visual sense matters with those tasks specifically. And I think it likely operates on some type of spectrum. Uh, but because these things are fairly emergent in a way, you know, we're finally getting to the point that uh, the price point to get into a high fidelity uh, simulated environment is is pretty close at this point. So um, 
you know, I think there's a lot of room for us to work with there. And I think it's, it's an exciting place to be. Yeah, absolutely. Now tell me about, you know, maintenance personnel specifically and how that's changed for you over the years as, as it's become more difficult to source, you know, uh, demo uh, equipment that you can put on the floor and have people tinker with. Yeah, so we we see maintenance as a big uh, a big opportunity for us, right? Uh, and and we think to to my point earlier about like the right fit stuff. Um, maintenance is a great space for a lot of this because you know at maintenance it's really hard for us to build a full motion maintenance simulator because it's the whole airplane. It's not just the cockpit anymore, right? Um, and especially when you get into the engines. I mean, these airplanes are very expensive. Um, and the way that aircraft manufacturers and much of manufacturing is happening at this point, they've gone to this lean methodology, right? Which means they're constantly trying to improve their production processes. So every airplane or every, a lot of, you know, any widget at this point that kind of attests to this is likely on some kind of, uh, you know, continuous improvement plan. And so what's happening more and more is you have essentially almost everything's a one-off to some extent, like you, you'll have improvements, especially with uh, production cycles that are long, like an airplane, a production cycle might be a few months and you might have revisions depending on how many airplanes you're building in a year. Uh, and so the importance there is one, from a training perspective, uh, it's increasingly uh, difficult for us to get access to physical uh, artifacts like, like engines or like airplanes, right? I mean, that's why we built the simulators to begin with, right? The same thing is happening on the maintenance side. And as we get new players in the field, whether it's like the VTOL guys or the uh, autonomous flight guys, um, they're gonna be in a similar circumstance where they're iterating their designs, but they're gonna need to be able to train their people. Immersive media could not possibly be better set up for that because we can hit the high level fidelity. And when you compare it to say buying a turbofan engine, the, the cost of fully rendering out a AAA uh, engine is way lower than buying a, uh, a brand new production turbofan engine of some sorts. And I would imagine many people that are in similar technical fields would probably have a similar experience there. So it, make, it behooves us like researchers that are in this space and, and practitioners alike, it behooves us to more or less, okay, let's make sure that what we're designing meets the safety requirements. So let's make sure that we can have a verifiable transfer of training into real life applications. Uh, and what that likely means is you're going to find some kind of blending here between, um, you know, the training experience and then the on the job side. And that's where I think you're going to find some cool stuff between uh, VR and AR that that really we haven't even gotten into yet, just because the adoption rate hasn't been there, because really the technology is just now becoming possible. Yeah, and, and we're almost out of time, but I did want to ask just one question. One of the things that, that we are, are relevant to this line of thought is that one of the things that we always uh, encounter, you know, with, with our in industrial clients is that, you know, they want to create, you know, an AR simulation of some piece of equipment, but they ha don't have the relationship with the OEM to get the original design drawing. So they have, they're like, how can we do this? You know, we're not going to model each one of these pieces of equipment. We're not going to reverse engineer it. So talk, talk a little bit about that, if you could briefly. Yeah, so we actually run into this quite a bit, right? You know, especially when it comes to something that's like antiquated uh, or legacy uh, airframe or engine or something like that. Or yeah, maybe we don't have a direct relationship with the manufacturer or even the manufacturer is giving us uh, stuff and uh, the manufacturing say like CAD files, uh, that, that is not going to port directly to, uh, you know, Blender or something like that for us. We, we would still have to do a lot of work there. So there's a, there's a whole element, whether it's the photogrammetry element where we're scanning things uh, or where we're, we're designing by hand. And a lot of that really comes down to going all the way back to your task analysis, understanding what's required. If you don't need the insides of an engine, if you don't need the insides of something else, then don't build it, right? I mean, there's just no reason for you to do it. But if uh, if you need it, then yeah, then you're going to have this kind of, let's say, let's call it a slider of costs based off of the number of tasks you need to do. But one of the really great things with either scanning or or even, even if you had to get to hand modeling, which is rare, the tools are becoming increasingly better. There's an increasing scope of like a library of resources that are available throughout the world uh, that, that come at various levels of cost. So I, I, it really is getting to the point that you could be zero to hero in an immersive setup like pretty quickly so long as you know what you're looking for and you know what you're trying to do which comes back to the obviously having a good design based off of what you're you know what what are the goals of the training intervention right well thank you so much 
Eamon, I appreciate it. If, if I know we're a little bit uh, over everyone, but if you have any questions, uh, please, please feel free to ask them via the chat and uh, we'll answer them. We'll stay around a little bit longer and answer them. Yeah, that, that really was a great and engaging conversation. Um, yeah, so let's move on to the slide Q&A. Uh, if you have a question for either one of our guest experts, uh, please put them in the chat now and we'll get to as many of them uh, as we can. Um, I see that there's one here already. I'll go ahead and read this off. Um, uh, this is for uh, Amen. Can you talk a little about how you go about designing evaluations to ensure skills have been learned? Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, the way that I, I do this is it, it kind of depends on what what you're trying to evaluate, right? So um, I personally like to make a, so it depending on the circumstance, but ultimately, if, if we can get ourselves to a point where we can make the uh, objective criteria, right, you, you essentially have to create a criteria. And if we can get that criteria to something that the learner essentially can relate to in real life, that is what my kind of target goal is. A lot of people don't like to just, oh, you will do this. Sure, that makes sense. Like you will be able to maintain this altitude or you will be able to torque this thing to this you know, torque value. Sure. Um, but I, I, if I can relate those to some kind of real life context uh, via scenario, that's fantastic because then generally speaking, people feel like they're being evaluated based off of the work that they meaningfully provide, right? And you know, we want those meaningful relationships, even when we're doing training, uh, because it kind of helps us, you know, it, it helps add to the learning experience in, the, in a way that is natural and feels right to the learner rather than just some box checking exercise, if you will. Yeah, and in the, the energy space, you know, there's a lot of um, a focus on uh, safety of the, the uh, surrounding communities, right? So you, if, if, you, if, you, if a plant blows up and explodes and kills several people or does a lot of uh, environmental damage in the nearby community, that's an extreme uh, risk from a financial perspective, right? Not to mention the loss of life. So what we're always espousing to those clients is, is you really want to do criterion reference testing where you're, you're going one-to-one -one as to what, what skill or element are you trying to teach this is this is the element within our training that that speaks to that so that later on if there's a question whether or not someone went through the appropriate training you can say well this this was the breakdown you know in in, in energy the the chemical safety board the uscfd kind of runs these these analyses post post event analyses that they go through and and they look at uh they look at you know what happened how they happened very extensive and they produce these 3d animations of each and every incident they're actually quite fantastic. Um, you know, even if you're not in that particular industry, it's amazing to see the level of analysis that they put into and how they how they get that information back out to industry, right? It's a service that the government provides so that we don't have these incidents again. But one of the things that have come out of that is, is the, the need to show the CFD that look, you know, yes, this happened and there was a mechanical failure and it and but the person that was in charge of that. It was by no fault of the training they received. They they received the necessary information. They didn't put it into practice. So let's you know do a five why analysis as to if they had the information, then why did it happen? Then why did that happen, etc. You know. So yes, yeah. No, that makes yeah. I, I I love that, and I like the idea of you know. So a lot of the stuff that I do is branching scenarios, right? And, and when one of the I mean amazing things with immersive media, especially when you're using a game engine or something like that, is is you can visually branch the scenarios like you, you could actually take something that you drew on a whiteboard like behind me and then place that right into the wireframe uh and and it's like boom like you could you could see it immediately how this would work uh and each of those branching scenarios can have different you know variable rankings or ratings or scores or badging or all kind of you know kind of the typical gaming things we think of uh in terms of you know your experience but then you can like lay it out like that it's it's I think it's amazing. It's, it's exactly what I like doing. <laughs> awesome. Okay, man. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed it. I uh, hope yeah. we'll to do it again sometime. And uh, uh, thank you, everyone who attended. Appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Josh and Eric. I really appreciate uh, ha having me on. This was great.
Yeah, yeah. Thank, uh, thank you, guys. Uh, and th thanks to everybody in our audience uh, who took time out from their day to spend with us. Uh, a recording of this webinar will be on our website. It's listed here on the screen. And uh, all right. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.